Hi, what we're going to be looking at today is biochemistry. We did do this during Head Start, but for those of you that have either forgotten some of the content, need another run through, or aren't doing VCE chemistry, this may help you. So if you get stuck, you can go back, refresh, and have another look at things. Probably the first thing that we need to ask ourselves is why do we need to understand chemistry if we are doing biology? Within the actual cell, there's a lot of chemistry that happens. On your exam, you do need to understand interactions between molecules and how this determines the shape of biomacromolecules, so a big biological molecule, and produce the binding sites for enzymes and substrates, signals and receptors, antibodies and antigens. We'll be covering enzymes in the next few weeks. Signals and receptors, that's an ongoing theme depending on which topic we're doing. Antibodies and antigens is part of the immune system. We need to know how various materials enter and leave a cell. So you already know that cells have particular jobs. Some cells may, their job may be to make a hormone. Once they've made that hormone within the cell, they then need to export it for use within other cells. We need to know how enzymes work to control and regulate cellular processes. Enzymes from year 11, you should remember or hopefully know that enzymes have optimal ranges for temperature and pH. So we need to understand how within the body do they get the optimum pH that they require to work. We need to know how cells receive and respond to signals, how the immune system works, how vaccines work. Drug design has been taken off the study design, but it is really helpful to understand because there's other underlying concepts such as specific binding sites that links into that. And experimental design is still in the study design. So if you can understand rational drug design, by default, you're also understanding experimental design. Apologies, this slide hasn't transferred from PowerPoint as well as I would have liked, but it's only the bottom bits that haven't worked. So, going back to junior science, probably about year 7 or year 8, so an atom. So, it's a molecule composed of protons and neutrons in the nucleus and electrons orbiting around the outside. The only exception is hydrogen because it does not contain any neutrons. So, when we go to do photosynthesis, you may read in a textbook about a proton acceptor. What that refers to is a hydrogen molecule. Elements. That's something that contains one type of atom. So they appear on the periodic table. They can't be simplified any further. The atomic number is determined by the number of protons. Hopefully you might remember that protons and electrons are the same number. The neutrons can vary. A compound is a molecule containing more than one type of atom. So for example, a compound would be something like carbon dioxide, which has carbon and oxygen molecules, whereas an element would be oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, anything that is a standalone entity. An organic compound. We deal with a lot of organic compounds in biology. They contain carbon bonded to hydrogen. They also usually contain oxygen. So a really good example, carbohydrates. They always go in the ratio of one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. A polar molecule is a molecule with a charge. So one part is positive and one part is negative. The molecule that you'll deal with the most this year that is polar is water. An ionic compound, there's a bond between ions, which are what we call charged elements, but it has an overall neutral charge. So you already would have heard the term hydrophilic and hydrophobic in relation to the plasma membrane. You should remember that hydrophilic is water loving, so the phosphate heads. Hydrophobic is water fearing, so like the fats and oils. When we look at chemistry, opposites attract. So positive and negative charges of ions, an ion gets its charge from the number of valence electrons, so electrons in the outer shell, and polar molecules attract, and they are described as hydrophilic. So if something has a positive and negative charge, it loves water. Atoms are non-polar molecules, so molecules with no charge and not attracted to water, and they're described as hydrophobic. So from what you already know, a hydrophilic molecule would be a phosphate, a hydrophobic molecule would be a fat. If you remember back to enzymes and their tertiary structure, so when they've started to fold, the reason for the location of the folds depends on whether or not certain particles within that enzyme are attracted or not attracted to each other. 
So from what we've already done, a molecule is a group of different types of elements. The atoms in these molecules, they're held together by bonds. There's three types of bonds that you should be aware of this year. So a covalent bond, so covalence, valence being the outer shell of the electrons, they arise from the sharing of electrons. So they are energy rich and they are strong. Another type of bond is a hydrogen bond. They are comparatively weak. So compared to a covalent bond, they're quite weak. If a bond is weak, makes sense, it's going to be more easily broken. They occur between polar molecules where the positive region of one mo molecule, so the hydrogen, is attracted to the negative region of another molecule. Hydrogen bonds, you do come across those when we look at enzymes and tertiary structure. You may read about it in your textbook. You'll never have to identify one on an exam. Ionic bonds, they occur between positive and negative ions. Remembering that an ion is an element or a molecule with a charge. Okay, so what we have here is just a couple of diagrams to help you to visualise what we're talking about. So, the first one, covalent bond. So, these oxygen guys, they're actually sharing the electrons. So, to fill the outer shell of an oxygen molecule, you need to have eight electrons. Oxygen has six, so if two oxygens join together, they can share. And what that means, then they've both got a full outer shell of electrons. With a hydrogen bond, so what you can actually see is the electrons from hydrogen are joining up with the electrons from oxygen. So hydrogen gives one electron, there's two hydrogens, so that gives two. With the six from the oxygen, then we've got full outer shells. So it's those guys just in the middle there. An ionic bond, so ionic, we've got a charge. I've got the positively charged hydrogen molecules and the negatively charged oxygen. The one thing that you might notice is that the oxygen molecule is much larger, therefore it's going to have a greater overall charge. One way to think about that, if I've got a magnet, you know a magnet has a north and a south end. A bigger magnet will draw a bigger charge than a smaller magnet. So a larger oxygen molecule with a negative charge will have a greater pull than a smaller positive charged hydrogen. Okay, so water is one of the most biologically significant molecules that there is. Hydrogen bonds make water molecules cohesive or sticky, and that gives rise to surface tension. Water has a really high heat capacity, so it can absorb a lot of heat without actually increasing greatly in temperature. That's really important if you think about we are 65 to 75% water in our bodies. If water had a low heat capacity, so it increased its temperature quite easily, that would have significant consequences for chemical reactions that occur within our body. Because as you probably know from year 11 and homeostasis, we like to keep our temperature regulated at around about 37 degrees. So if our temperature changed too quickly or too rapidly, that would mean that we'd have to sweat profusely, alter our body temperature, metabolism would slow down. So it's really, it makes sense that our bodies are a high component of water and the temperature doesn't change very much. It's got a high heat of vaporization, so it requires a large amount of heat to evaporate. And more importantly, it acts as a solvent of ionic compounds. If something is a solvent, it means that things can dissolve in it. So you already know that a molecule is a group of atoms bonded together. A biomacromolecule is basically a giant molecule. So bio, biological, macro, big, molecule, group of atoms. In terms of cells, they play an essential role in both the structure and function. What you probably aren't aware of is that you've already come across biomacromolecules already. Proteins, carbohydrates, nucleotides, they are all examples of biomacromolecules. So to understand the chemical basis of life, we do need to have some understanding of the biomacromolecules. So how they're made, how they're assembled, and how they function. So cells import water, mineral ions, and a heap of small organic molecules, such as simple sugars, fatty acids, and amino acids. Many other small organic molecules are made and altered in different chemical reactions within the cell. Small molecules also store and distribute energy for cellular processes and others, such as hormones, act as signals in directing the activities of the cell. 
With biomacromolecules, we can only acquire them or have them by making them. They're made in a condensation reaction. When you think of condensation, so you have a shower, it steams up. When the steam goes back to water, that's called condensation. So we're looking at something to do with water. Okay, so the different types of biomacromolecules. These type of tables or charts, they turn up in exam questions quite regularly. So if you can get an understanding of the different types, their subunits or monomer, and what their function is, you're looking at picking up some really easy marks in your exam. So first one, lipids. A lipid is not a polymer because each monomer is not identical. They are made of fatty acids and glycerol, so the fat and the glucose component. Their function, energy storage, they're a component of cell membranes, and they're also involved in signaling molecules. They join together through ester linkages. Another type, so your complex carbohydrates or your polysaccharides. Poly, many, a saccharide is a sugar. The subunit or the monomer in this instance, they are simple sugars, so your monosaccharides. Mono meaning one, saccharide meaning a sugar. The function of the sugars, so energy store and the structural components of cells. So when you think of cellulose in plants, in their cell walls, that's a structural component. They're joined together through glycosidic linkage. Glyco, glucose, linkage to join. Then we've got our nucleic acids or polynucleotides. Poly, many, nucleotide, the bases. Their subunits are the nucleotide monomers. Their function, nucleotides are part of DNA, so the information molecules that constitute an organism's genetic material, so the blueprint for how you work. Our final type of biomacromolecule is a protein or a polypeptide. Poly meaning many. Their subunits are the amino acids. Remember with the amino acids, what makes them unique is their R group. The function of proteins, they have got a heap of different roles. They can control and regulate cellular processes. Enzymes assist in transport of substances. So you've got protein channels within cell membranes, act as receptors and as structural components. They join together through peptide linkage. Okay, so what we've got here is an example of how the condensation reaction works. So we're looking at how do we take smaller molecules and make them into biomacromolecules. So in this instance, we'll assume that this is a protein. So we've got our monomer in the middle. So the monomer is the identical repeating part. And on the outside, it's got a reactive hydroxyl group or an OH. So each monomer has an OH on either end and the monomer in the middle. So I've got two OH groups. This is where they're going to join together. So what I've got, I've got two hydrogens and two oxygens. You should know already that water is H2O. So I take out two of the H's and one of the oxygens. My oxygen then joins the monomers together and water is released from the reaction. So it's a condensation reaction because a water molecule has been removed. If I want to break the bond, I work in the opposite way, I add a water molecule that is known as hydrolysis.